Okay. This is a, have you ever heard that term in golf called a mulligan? It's where you get to play the hole over. <laughs> it's, it's a, I'll, I'll take a mulligan on that one. So between the rough sketch, which is preliminary and your more finished sketch, when you're saying this is, this is now based on our discussions, this, this is exactly where I think we need to go with this character. And this is before you put in color, you might attach swatches. There's a lot of other things that you can do with that. Okay. So this should be more detailed. Maybe you're going to correct something that you feel wasn't exactly accurate. So the accuracy to the character is, is more complete here. You're really trying to say, is everything on the page working for this particular character? And then you're going to do a, a more formal presentation. So now we can look at these uh, sketches. And again, it's not, you're not having to do any sort of color yet. You're not doing anything like that. So now let's look at our, at our site again for this assignment. Okay. So what you're doing is you're refining the character through sketching. You can sketch right on top of your rough sketch. You've already uploaded those, or you can redraw them. Another thing you can do is you can actually put them on a sheet of tissue paper of, uh, of transparent paper. What is that called when you are using it to draw through something? Tracing. Tracing paper. Yeah, that's thank you for that. Think, trying to think what is else, what else is it called? So you can actually put a piece of tracing paper on top and let me show you what that could look like. So like this, you can put a piece of tracing paper on top of a sketch and then you can work through that again. Okay. And cover up, use your main ideas, maybe make some more detailed lines. So I'm going to show you that guy in a second. So let's go back to that page. And then you can redraw on top of the sketch with some kind of black pen. You can even do it in your regular sketch, just with your sketch. Some kind of pen, you can even do it with a really sharp pencil. And you don't need to erase anything unless you put in the proportionate lines. That is not something that should be included in any drawing, okay? It shouldn't be in your redrawings. That is, that's a secret. You never want to give your secrets up. I always maintain that lighting designers you know, they have the most invisible job because they just talk in ideas and you don't actually see anything until you see the lights hitting the actors on stage. So this is one of the secrets that we have as designers is we can use these proportionate tools so that we get a body that looks right. Unless you're like super comfortable and you're an amazing artist and some people are. Some people have come to costume design because they love to draw the human figure. So, you know, Try to define the costume details and you're going to look at those costume details based on your redrawings that you've done. Are you fully and completely identifying the character? So in each sketch presentation, and this is the more formal presentation versus the rough sketch, you're going to turn in four sketches without color. Each sketch has one figure and I should say actually each page has one figure eight to 12 inches tall, labeled with the title to play, labeled with the character name and any other details that you want to communicate. So let's look at a couple of sketches. So this is, let me see how high up I can get this guy. Here we go. This is a sketch for a play. There were probably maybe 50 or 60 sketches in this play. So this is not, uh, this play is, Lope de Vega is the playwright. Lo fingido verdado, which is what you pretend may be true, may not be true. And so it's a whole duplicity thing. It was done half modern and half, uh, the director had this idea of it should be Star Wars meets, no, was it Star Wars is his favorite thing. 
And um, like Star Wars meets George Bush. I know George Bush was the president because that was part of the whole thing. The set designer had painted the Oval Office floor underneath some rubber shavings. And we had this very abstract concept. So here's a sketch of a collar that's coming up very high over a cape. We see no arms. Underneath is a tunic split front, a belt of order underneath. You can see the detail here, full trousers to the floor. There's a little shoe pointing out. This is the name of the sketch, a detail that the actor would be bald. Um, and in this case, actually shave their head. You should sign your sketch. This is the character name, Arrow, and Apro was the name of the actor. Here's another sketch from the same, uh, I think this guy was like, Arrow was some kind of a, a fortune teller seer. He, had, he was kind of high ranking. Lope, uh, same play, Lope de Vega, another character. This is a senator, the Diocleziano senators. There were two of them, Richmond and Morante were the actor's names. There's an undergown with sleeves and cuffs. There's a sleeveless overgown with this shoulder piece added. This is a Mandarin front collar. And those are details. These are things that you can talk to the costume shop about how you're going to make it, the fullness of it. This is a shaped hood. So this is going over the hair, not hair. It's a piece of fabric that's stiff and shaped and goes over the head. He has a stick or a rod or something that he carries. And then here's another uh, character from the same play, one of the emperors. They actually had two guys playing twin emperors, although the, the play itself called for one. So this is one of those cases where they decided that they would um, it was a trying to show the duplicity of the human being. So this is Diocleano, Clesiano, split trousers, short, showing his boots underneath. He has a drape of order here that's attached and hangs down as a cape. And then here is the uh, drape of order on the other side. So it attaches here. The cape is attached at this shoulder. The point of the cape is attached at this shoulder and then it's revealed here, okay? So we see the trousers. We see the wide belt, which helps attach the cape of order. A chest band also helping to attach the cape of order, which attaches here. And then he's bare chested. So this sketch gives us the title of the play, the character, the emperor, some description of the, of the garment, and then this could be made a Xerox so that whoever's making the garment can just write all over it. This is the character's name, Emperor, and Jenks is the actor in this case, and then the signature of the designer. Okay, questions about that? Does that make sense to everybody? So that's what I say, it's a bit more formal, but you can literally take the sketch that you have and you can use that and you can put it on the page. So if you have a sketch and you need to upload it, you can photograph it and then you can put it into your Google Doc and upload it. I just wanna know if you have any questions on that. We're gonna work on this today. So you, I'm gonna have you, you work on them and I'll look at your roughs that you've uploaded. And then this weekend, I, as this is the fifth week, I'll get everything else graded up to this point so that you'll know exactly where you are in class. Any questions on that? So this is the end of the Thin Man. And in real life, uh, I'm going on with the Thin Man. I'm going to be having to work on the puppet and doing all kinds of stuff with it. But we're in class going to go on to a different, different project because when we talked last time about collaboration as the designer once you get the sketch to this point there's other things that you're going to learn about sketching and adding color and representing cloth and do, doing that kind of stuff but then you are able to then execute see it through the execution 
And so that I can teach you something different about it, we're going to talk about a different play from now on for the next section. And then you'll have one third play that will be the final play. Okay, so I just want to know if you have any questions so far about that or any of the homework. Uh, well, I have a question, but yeah. it's not really about any homework uh, or stuff, but I, I just wondered if I missed something before I came in. No, I was late. Oh, I okay. came very late because I could not. Google kept crashing for some reason, and then I had to shut down my computer and I tried to go to my other computer. Anyway, long, boring story. It's like dropping a phone call. Okay, good. Good luck, right? <laughs> You didn't you didn't miss anything if you came in and when I recorded you didn't miss anything except me running around like a crazy person. Okay. <laughs> Which no one could see and by the way, thank you so much for hanging in there and actually waiting and being patient I do totally appreciate that. And did you get the announcement that I sent I tried to send through the announcements that I could not get in. So you should have caught that should have come to your email. I got that yeah. Okay, good. So I appreciate that that I when something like that happens and then and then for some weird reason i couldn't get zoom to open in the actual way and in the normal way that i have been opening it so i actually went to my email and someone diego saved my life diego had joined the zoom and i opened it from that email that said diego had joined the joined the zoom because i couldn't get through on the tab that I had that I've been using for weeks. So, you know, every day is you just never know what's going to happen and you just have to keep moving forward and figuring things out. Okay. So, those are our, that's our wrap up for the Thin Man. And I'm dying to see what everybody has. So, today you will spend time trying to work on getting your presentations for the Thin Man together and then annotating them with. Let's just make sure that we have those. They, they are formal and you'll be putting I'm just going to draw a rough uh, outline. And these are on your sheet. You, you can put the play title anywhere. And sometimes people are very, very creative with how that works based on uh the play like maybe you think the thin man should go this way and it should be the title should be along the side because it's a thin long squiggly thing you know that completely can be your choice you can use a preset font on your computer and put it on there if you want to and then just take your your sketch and upload it onto that your your title of your play can be anywhere but the things that you must include are the title and the character name and your signature. Why do you need to include your signature? Because you're endorsing it as unique to yourself. Right. In it actually has uh, been determined that you could copyright your sketch. So you want to make sure that you identify it as yours. So place your figure, and you can choose to place your figure not in the middle. You could have your figure over here. Let's say we're going to put him here. And you're going to put your title this way. The Thin Man. And then you put your character here. And maybe this, we're gonna do Nick. You know, you can be very um, expressive with that sort of thing. Let me move this closer. So you can see how you want to put this in here. You can draw lines, you can put it in the center. You can have it be bisected. You can give them a little ground to sit on. And this is very uh, handy in that sometimes you see them standing in a place. Sometimes it's just a line. Sometimes you just give a little line back here showing here's the horizon line, right? So now they're in front of the wall. 
and there's a wall implied back here. Does that make sense to everybody? So we're gonna try and work with those things in the lab today. So we're gonna work with the title, putting the title, the character, the signature, in other words, design your page. Design the page and then also give it a ground. And this ground is can be just a simple line. Sometimes you want to have a line here so that you kind of see where they are in relationship. And then this becomes the title portion or the or the working portion, the, the language of it. And then you want to make sure that the detail of the sketch is clear that includes the very signature features that are our time period. So that we know this is a specific time period instead of something else. And one of the things that you want to keep in mind with 30, 1934 for women is the length of the skirt. Okay, so this is something that can be misleading in your, in your textbook, which I'll show you in your history book. It's generally 10 inches, right? Sorry, can you say that again? It's generally 10 inches above the ground, right? Is where the skirt ends? That's the typical fashion statement, yes. Yep, that's correct. So I just wanna show you the sketch that's in your book that many people use, but it's, you have, to, you have to look at the text that's in your book. And I know it's not ideal. It doesn't just say, oh, look, this is 19 X. It doesn't, it's, so if you're using this sketch, I think it's page two. So I'm gonna just show you a couple of different things. So this sketch is in the 1940s, okay? That's not a 1930s sketch, but you have to see that because it talks about it down here. It's in the text of the page. The 30s are the year before that. It's, it's military influenced, that's how you can tell. Compared to even earlier, this is 39, you see that the clothing is much more soft. It is still creeping, the hemline's creeping up, but the military influence isn't as um, carefully articulated. This is particularly showing this one in 1938, the hats that are worn at Ascot or horse racing. But here we have some 1934 details of wide shoulders. This is sort of an evening gown. This would be a day dress with a corsage print so that you can see each one of these things. But again, what's the problem with this? We don't have a vertical figure to look at. So what you do in that case is you look at the magazine picture, you draw your body, as I've said before, and then you can draw this on top of your body. Just keep your body kind of lightly in the background. And even here, you can sort of see the silhouette of the body underneath, okay? And here we have a person standing in an evening gown. And you can see, remember the back interest is very important in the 1930s. Here you can see a full length and you could simply shorten these and for day dresses it's about 10 inches off the ground but you can see here's 1930 this is earlier it's longer it also is referencing the 20s more because it's a little shapeless so these are all in your book but you need to and don't don't confine yourself to your book only okay this is an excellent view of a front bodice. But again, this is a longer skirt, but if you made it just above the ankle, you could have it be in 1934. Something that may happen as well is when we talk about the character of Dorothy versus the character of Nora or the character of Mimi, Mimi is older. She's gonna, she's gonna reflect the 1920s more than Dorothy. So she, Mimi might have a slightly different silhouette because the 20s are a little straighter, but Dorothy's skirt might be a little bit shorter because she's a younger woman. And just like we talked about sleeves, 
maybe long for Mimi, but shorter, she could wear the butterfly sleeve for Dorothy. Okay, so you want to refine the details of the characters that you've selected. Did, it, did you select to draw the puppeteer? I think I said, I tried to steer you away from that. Okay. So, because that, that adds yet another layer on top of, of trying to represent a character. So you want a contemporary body, like the ones that we've looked at, out of a magazine, you can download something off the internet, you can trace that body onto your page if you want to, draw your costume on top of that. And so look at your costumes and then just refine them slightly, okay? I did uh, draw Asta, um, uh, you know, pup, with the puppeteer kind of in the background a little bit. Um, so you drew um, the puppet, you drew the puppet, the dog puppet? Yeah, and the puppeteer in the back, in the background, controlling the... Um, right, okay. Puppet. So you can decide, I'll, I'll take a look at that uh, in just a second while we're doing our drawing and I can put you in a breakout room, we'll talk about that, okay? All right. Okay, great. Because you need to decide both is a puppeteer man or woman? Um, how much does a puppeteer influence the period? How much does the puppeteer influence the puppet? How is the puppet operated? And is what you've represented a, a way that the puppet can actually operate? So when you start getting into drawing a prop like that, something that has to be manipulated, there's a it's just a lot more complex. So you can think about whether you want to continue with that character or you can do another character if you want. We'll talk, we can talk about that in a breakout room after we have our break, okay? Uh, and, oh, Diego, now that you're connected with audio, I asked you early on, did you get your sketches yesterday in the mail? Yeah, I, I got my swatches in the mail yesterday. Uh, swatches, sorry. Okay, very good. So Clement, you should be getting yours Thursday or Friday according to our USPS, United States Postal Service, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, because we you need to have those and please kind of uh, for Wednesday next week, you should be bringing, you should have your swatch kit. You should have it flattened out. And I want you to pick your biggest swatch out so that and measure it. And I'll, I'll write a note so that I put this in a in the swatches page. I was just thinking about this today. I want you to have, if you have a biggest swatch, I wanna know what that is because we'll use that for a little draping project. And once I get people's measurements, I will know. So when you get your swatches, you should make sure that they are all flat, that you can um, you can iron them if they are transparent or if they're not 100% cotton, they may melt. So you wanna make sure that your iron is geared towards that. And if you don't have your swatches yet or you have the small swatches like Sue has, then you can pick some other thing that you can use for the draping project, like a tea towel, a, um, you know, a towel that is not terry cloth, but it just a, a tea towel is usually linen or some kind of lightweight cloth. It could even be a scarf, okay? And I'll make notes because I'm gonna publish that. And I'm trying to be inventive about how we can do a project without you having any real fabric and we can identify. So I want you to, I'll make a note that you should identify your, your swatch, go through each swatch and identify your largest piece. But for Wednesday, you'll need your swatches flattened You'll need a small pair of scissors. And you'll need a flat page to work on. And it, if it had some stiffness, it could be, it, I see your hand, it could be um, the back of a sketchbook so that you can just have that small piece of cardboard, okay? So Josephine, question? Yeah, I was just wondering if we're gonna do a finished sketch. Uh, Not of this. Um, look, for, look for sketches. Nope. I mean, you're doing, you're turning in your finished sketch. You're not coloring it. 
you're doing this, this is what you're turning in by Friday. Yeah, but, but I was just wondering if we were going to do the, all of the four of the sketches. Okay, I'm not understanding the question, I don't think. Okay, well, yeah. Mm. So you will be, you, the assignment is to upload four finished sketches. Yeah, but does it have to be the same one as we did? Before. Before. No. No, I, okay. like I told Diego, if he wants to do something, he doesn't want to do the puppeteer and the puppet, he can pick somebody else. Okay, okay. It can be out of the thin man. You, often a rough sketch just gives you information. And then, um, you know, in this situation, you have a choice because you're not doing the entire play. So you're doing just part of it and you're doing part that represented. So if you're going to take, uh, everybody has to do Nick and Nora, please don't avoid that. That is something, but the other two are up to you. But if you decide that instead of doing Julia, you want to do Mimi or you want to do um, Dorothy, that's fine. If you want to do the inspector instead of Macaulay or you want to do Morelli, uh, that's okay too. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. So it could be anything. So for Wednesday, please have your swatches. And they should be flattened. You need a piece of, of uh, firm paper or cardboard. And you need scissors. Uh, I want you to reuse these, but maybe you need something like a glue stick or tape or some pins if you can stick into your board or your paper or paper clips. So maybe just some way to, if, if we are moving these swatches around, you can kind of make them stick somewhere temporarily, okay? So for Wednesday, that's what we're gonna work on. Now I'm gonna introduce our next segment, which is gonna be a new play. So let's take a look at that. And I'll show you the page for it so that you can see it. And this is on our week six. Uh, it's on week five, just because so that you have it now. Here is the next play we're going to do is The Lion in Winter. There's a couple of things about this page that are very helpful. One is I have included the play here, but I want to talk about each of these different elements. So this is called the Playbill. The Playbill is the program from the original production. This happens to be a program from, I think, 1966, but it also could be if it was redone in 1999 or it was redone in 2017, when you go to playbill.com, you will find different playbills. So here is the Playbill website. Okay, so I wanna show you what that looks like. Are you guys going to the website? You can see that? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you're in my other class, this is actually something that m many people did not know and we just, it has been discovered. So this will give you information on a, a wide variety of productions of the play. And we've talked about when you do something more than once. So you can see that it has been done. If you look up Lion and Winter, you'll see that it's been on Broadway several times. And you could look at any playbill. This is the one that I showed you is this image, which it includes all the cast, there will be some photos. There will be uh, the preview, how many performances they did, and each of the pages of the of the playbill you can look at. Right. So if I look at this, and I can zoom even in on it to see the title, I can see who the lighting designer was, the production manager, the scenery and costumes, and then I can go to the next page. 
and then I can see what it's like. So one thing that's really great about that is it shows you what the professional program looks like. If you uh, want to simply reread this play, it's here. And you can just open it up like this. And you can read it on your laptop or your Chromebook or wherever. So this is written in 1968. Yeah, so clearly it couldn't have been in, must have been 1969 on Broadway. Um, this is the, Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn were in the movie. So this is probably rewritten for the movie. And you're going to see something slightly different than the play version because this will say exterior on a hill daytime. And you'll see Henry and his youngest son, John. Now, I have done this play, so I know that that is how they start. And then this is the one that we're gonna work on. So we have our characters, Henry and John. What is different about this than a typical script that you get is that you're not seeing a character list. So you will need to make a character list as you read it. And that's a, that is, that's a fairly typical thing anyway, because you'll want to take some notes about each of the characters. So we have Henry II, we have John, who clearly is his son. So now we're starting a relationship and a family tree. And then we have his love. And this is, this name can be pronounced a multitude of ways. Sometimes they call it Alice. Sometimes they call it Alice, Alice. So there's, however you want to visualize it, you can. And then you'll see that the script is, it's 111 pages long, but they're very spaciously set out, okay? So that's what you're gonna do, you can read that. And clicking on it takes you to a new tab and you can just read it. If you want, prefer to purchase it, I've given you an Amazon link so that you could do that. There's absolutely no reason to spend money. You know, you can totally just read it, like you can read it online. And then check out this Wikipedia page for it because uh, this gives you this 1966 play and then you can also see the 1968 film. It's set in 1183. One of the reasons why we're using this play is because it coincides with the redrawings that are due next week based on chapter three, early Europe or the Middle Ages. And this is also an easy way for you to see the characters because this is the characters in the play. And if you come down here, it tells you the characters in the play. And the great thing about this play is it's very confined, very few characters compared to something even like the Thin Man. Here's Henry II, Queen Eleanor, John, Geoffrey, and Richard, the three sons of Henry and Eleanor, Alais, and Philip, King of France, sister and brother. So the King of France, the King of France's sister. So there are your characters. So when I'm giving you the information, it's just so that you can get what's going on in this play even before you're reading it, okay? So those are some things for you to do before we come back on Wednesday. There's not, uh, there is no assignment due and I'll show you the wrap up. Okay, so that's just, there's no assignment. That's just a page and it's listed in our module. The assignment is to read it, right? Sorry that the modules are so long, here we go. And then wrapping up to look ahead, these things are in. Looking ahead at reading in Ingham and Covey or chapter four, your redrawings are from labor chapter three, which coincides with the same time period as line in winter. And be sure you submit your Thin Man sketches. So this is an opportunity for you guys to get a bit caught up as well. And then I'm going to take a moment. Questions before I do this? Would you want us to do a cross plot for this other play? I'm going to. 
Uh, I'm going to leave that up to you. So the question was, do I want you to do a cross plot for this play? Um, I'm, you know, I'm one to try to have you do no busy work. And I, I personally do a cross plot for every single play that I work on, mm -hmm. but you understand the technique of a cross plot and the, um, here, we'll come back to this in a second, but you understand the technique of a cross plot and what it does for you. So if it is helpful for you to, to track the play by doing a cross plot, then absolutely do it. I, you know, I'm showing you one tool. And then we're gonna be talking more specifically next week about um, organization of procurement and budgeting and that kind of thing, because we'll be on a whole different kind of production. So this is one where last time someone said, oh, well, what about if it's a contemporary production, can we just buy the clothes? And I said, yeah, you know, and, in, and I said, even in a 1920s play, we could buy, there's things that we can buy. You can buy shirts, you can buy other things. But now we're talking about something that is in the 12th century. So that's that's unlike unlikely that you'll be able to buy something. You may be able to use something, and you have to be very inventive if you do that. But it'll it's a it's a completely different kind of design. So think about if you want to use that tool, the cross plot. I'm not going to require that but that's something that you might need for discussion purposes. Okay, thank you. So up to you, if that's a tool that's valuable, okay? So for now, just uh, read the play, do your character list, try and get your relationships, however you wanna figure those out. You know, you wanna do a family tree, you wanna do ages. Just think about how you, based on the information that you have, now you're gonna read a play for the first time and you decide how you wanna organize it. And on Wednesday, we'll talk about that because the assignment that we do is gonna be related to um, your time period, okay? One of the things that I wanna show you about the time period is a, it's, you know, how, question? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought somebody said um, something and I just wanted, didn't wanna cut you off. So one of the things that I wanna show you about that time period is in your redrawings. So fabric swatching is the thing that we're going to work on. I can't, I put these in very quickly just so you could take a look at them. So on Wednesday, that's what we're gonna do, fabric swatching to a painting and discuss line in winter and I'll flesh this out over the weekend. And then the redrawings are male and female in early European dress. You can. Remember when I say use your labor book for image and vocabulary reference, that doesn't mean that every drawing that you need is gonna be in that book. The reason why I give you that book is because it does have colored drawings and it has a pretty good cross section and it's not 400 pages or like Amelia Davenport's History of Costume. It's not you know 1200 pages in two volumes. I'm giving you something that's manageable, but it's definitely not the, the end all reference. By now, when you're starting to think about a character, you're probably not finding all the images that you have in your head. You're thinking, well, I'd rather have her in a dress something like this. I wonder if there's something that I can look at that looks like that. And then you have to start searching for things. So in this time period, which is early European dress, one of the most important documents that we have is called the Bayou Tapestry. And these are embroidered figures from the Bayou Tapestry. There are some, and now we're gonna talk about redrawings and drawing them in proportionate because you can see that this character is not proportionate. There is distortion here and you don't wanna replicate the distortion in your redrawing. That's why I encourage you to start with drawing the body first and then putting the clothes on top, okay? Uh, I will give you vocabulary, I haven't filled that in yet, but I wanted you to be aware of the Bayou Tapestry and I guess, okay, I have, let me just edit this for a second because I put, have to put in all the alt views and it doesn't say 
what these are from. So I just want you to know that. The Bayou Tapestry is a 12th century embroidered piece. So each one of these figures, and it's something like 12 feet long. So when you look at this, you're looking at hand stitching. Let's see if I can zoom in on that for you. So these are all hand stitched pieces. This is something that is from the 12th century that still exists. You can actually go look at this piece of historical work that represents, here's what people wore. So it's another form of historical research other than what we've had in the past, which have been, you know, we started with cave paintings, with, uh, with sculpture, with bas relief, with workable fine objects like vases that have images on the sides from our Greek and Roman with inlaid stones. If you looked at the early part of the Byzantine mosaics that are inlaid. Um, but this is a new piece and you can see that these are all threads and the thread is on this neutral ground to indicate the costume. So when we look at this carefully, we can see he's wearing a cap that has this flipped up brim. He had, you can see the hair here, a collar, a sleeve with a band, a tunic to the knee. There's a panel here. You can see three panels, a girdle belted, uh, hanging down a bit. And I'm not sure what this is. So I'd want to take a look at something. Maybe there's a panel under the sleeve. I don't know what's happening there. But you can see that these are actual stitches. And then black stitches put on top of this hand stitching to indicate the folds. This is where we get the hanging sleeve. A gown and overgown, the headpiece. And the next image you have is this, this, these are on the same piece of cloth. It tells us, um, it is, uh, I think it tells us the story of the Crusades. I should have looked that up before I talked about it today. And this is the king, Rex is the king, a crown. He's wearing more like a Dalmatica with trim. You can see the trim here. It's a gown, flat shoes with no visible way to tie them on necessarily. Some kind of leggings with flat shoes on these two subjects. Again, a tabard on top, a belted tunic underneath. So think about all the information they can get from this. But the reason why I bring this up is just because it is a piece of embroidery, hand stitched history instead of painted painted or instead of ceramic. So I've included that, which is not included in your textbook. How but long would something like that have taken to create? It's a lot, you know, handcrafts were something that people worked on for a long time. And when, as soon as a girl was of a certain age, they she would start working on the dowry of what she would take with her when she left her family home. So that would be um, you just get better at it. Uh, but this, but the Bayou Tapestry, I think it's something like twelve yards long by a certain length wide, and it's a it was a, rolled up in a scroll to tell the story of the Crusades. So it actually is a little bit earlier. Like I think it's like in 10, 1095 or something, but it has to do with the Crusades. So early 11th century. So it depends on how fast your, your, you know, your embroidery hand sewing is. But I bring it up because it's something that you might want to look at. It, it's a really interesting thing and you could actually go look at it. Um, when I went to Italy for I don't know, I can't remember, it wasn't the first or second time. People said, I said, well, I have to go to Ravenna. Why am I going to Ravenna? Because I want to see the Byzantine mosaics because I saw them in the costume class. 
I mean, I actually went to see works of art because I had studied them in the costume class and they happened to be in, I wanna see if you have them in your book. They happen to be um, mosaics that are placed into, frescoed into a wall with real pearls. So it was just amazing. And people, uh, one friend in particular said, I don't see why you're going there. That's like going to on a busman's holiday to Long Beach. So here's the, um, they're on, in your book on page 49. So here's the picture of the Byzantine mosaics. And these were precious stones and pearls. And you can actually go see them. You know, you can just, they're on a ceiling. You can go see them. You can go into that um, Justin and Theodore and you can go in and see them in that church. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. And then when we come back, we're gonna work on the finished sketches, okay? Has anybody finished yours already and you don't wanna do that? Because otherwise we'll work on them. I'd like to see your layout. And in the meantime, I'm gonna look at where your roughs are so I can talk to you specifically about them in a breakout room while we're having our lab, okay? Wait, I have a question about fashion that's it's semi-related to like time period and stuff. Okay. Um, like, was there was there always like a pushback of like something new coming in to kind of like set a standard or whatever? Because I think like um, in kind of contemporary looks, like there's a lot of pushback or, or someone that is like a socialite or something. There's a lot of maybe like negative comments about them. You know, I do you know what I'm trying to ask? Like, how does new stuff be in, like, how is it introduced? I guess, like, okay, so I think I think you're actually talking about I me, mean, you're talking about two separate things fashion, as it is in our contemporary world, mm -hmm. is really um, influenced particularly by money. Okay, how can the man, how can the designer slash manufacturer make money by introducing new things? And we've created a very disposable society. So when you start talking about uh, our new things introduced just to create fashion, the very first time that I can remember that happening, which was not related to function, was when we had the new look in 1947. So in 1947, we, uh, early on uh, today, I talked about in World War II. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we go all the way back, we had started, we, everything was pretty long, right? Women wore long things in the, in Greek and Roman, they wore long things, unless of course they were one of the bikini girls. Didn't you guys love that in your book? <laughs> the bikini girls in the mosaic, they did wear bikinis. That was not new. Um, but uh, generally women wore long things. Men wore long things. Men wore gowns to the ground. And then we got leggings, which are two separate legs. It's not like tights. They did not, there was no crotch. For the longest time, they could not understand the crotch. So in the period that we're going to work with with line and winter, they didn't really understand how that curved shape for the crotch to figure out pants. So they're moving from tunics to these very sort of two individual leggings, which are tied up and... Um, and then we'll move from this into the cod piece, which is two leggings then separated by a cod piece that is hold, held together. And then your shirt covers up the rest of your body. So there's, it's a really sort of interesting thing, but going even from there, if we just zoom forth through the 13th century to the 16th century, the Renaissance, 17th, 18th, the 19th century, which is people have that in mind. Like if you think of the old West or Prairie days, still long, clothes. The, the hemline started going up really in about 1908, 1910. And then partly because women started doing different kinds of work. So, and then remember the suffragette movement in 1920 and women getting the vote, then, it, then things are changing even more drastically and quicker. Then we have the roaring 20s. That's when things got very spangly and short. And that's a, in reference to the crash of 1929, hemlines went down. So fashion is often influenced by historical events. Mm -hmm. So the crash 
then hemlines went down because suddenly now we had had too much fun and now we're going to cover everything back up again. Menswear has gotten a little more refined, but basically stays somewhat the same and gets different sort of shoulders and that kind of thing. Um, Josephine, and then I'll go from the crash and I'll tell you where, where I think you're going. Okay. Yeah, well, I was just wondering, like uh, in costume design, I feel like uh, uh, the trends uh, are like harder to like describe now because there's so many different trends. Uh, from like a hundred years ago, if you have a picture of like like anything, just a road or something, everyone kind of has the same outfit. I well, mean, like, I'm, is it harder I, now to like describe what? what not, maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure. I agree with that. You know, okay. here, here's what I think you're responding to, and then we'll go and we can talk about that in a minute. But there's less information available in past times. So when you're looking at historical pictures, you have less information available. Remember that this information superhighway that we have called the internet was not even very common in 2000, 20 years ago. Uncommon. People were not using it. So the amount of stimulation and imagery that you have at your fingertips is very foreign before 20 years ago. So because you can see more things, you may think that there's more choice, but every period of time has had people taking whatever garment was the acceptable silhouette and line and modifying it for their own use. So absolutely, people were taking those garments and individualizing them. It's just that the information that you have to look at what people were doing is limited. And much like today, often, for example, in your book, you're looking at society or you're looking at an illustration and an illustration doesn't represent what humans wore. That's why I try to have you look at things like the photographs of the 1930s that I put in the redrawing page are very different than an illustration, right? People look lumpy. They don't look sleek and glamorous. And, and that's one thing about a designer is you have to, you have to, sort of walk that very careful line of always making the character look the absolute best that they can for the character. And the director can get fixated on some sort of fashion illustration, which can have nothing to do with the character because they've cast somebody that's a size 16. You know, and it's a, it, so it, it, you're always trying to balance what you have seen, that's why research is so important. You need to look at all kinds of research, trying to look at working, working wear servants from, you know, 1600s, very, very difficult. And before we had the internet, you know, there were these two or three little books that like, oh, I have to have that book because that talks about working, working wear. Um, so, I think it's more easily available and that's why I think it's easier to identify the trends now. I particularly, I actually think that fashion is much less interesting than it was because I think it is more arbitrary because it's become more disposable. So we're still gonna go back to 1929, Sue. Um, I just have a couple of things to say, ask, well, one to ask. The Bayou Tapestries, that's in France, right, Bayou? Yeah. Okay, I thought, I thought so, my sister's, my sister's actually seen it. And, but I also yeah, have, and in person, it's so impressive. Yeah, I, know, I haven't been, but she has. Um, but I also had another point to make about, you're talking about the not discovering how to go do the crotch, when actually, to show my age, sorry, but when I grew up, and when we went into, we didn't have, we didn't have pantyhose. We didn't have. Oh yeah. Legs. We we had the bar garter belts and the and the stockings because I remember going into the others <laughs> and the slipping down. <laughs> well, actually, that's actually you're absolutely right, Sue. We did a play here called Crimes of the Heart, and the the discussion of pantyhose was prominent in the play. 
So I had to, I did a lot of research over the time frame in which pantyhose was invented, and we did not have the elastic quality that we have now. You know, everything you wear now is has stretch. Even your jeans have stretch. That never happened. That's a very recent. It started in the 80s when we started getting um, exercise wear and people started working out and then, you know, went into leggings. Leggings used to be considered obscene. You'd never wear them out in public. And now everybody only wears leggings practically, you know, and some of them you're thinking, please, I do not want to see leggings. (laughs) That's a little too much information. But, um, you know, so every time period has something different but absolutely the two stockings I had stockings from my grandmother that were silk I actually had real silk stockings they were incredible and phenomenal so um, that's a very good point there's there are there are things that are noted in certain plays that have very specific costume reference that you have to honor and you have to research for example the reason why that was so important in crimes of the heart is because she had to take the pantyhose out of a box and then to me, nothing, I don't know, I think they hate me sometimes, but it's like, you know, I'm telling the prop person, that's the wrong, you can't have that box. That's not a box from that time period. There, that would not have been used. So there are people in the audience that would remember that kind of box. So you want to make sure, again, with costume design, the most important thing is understanding the vision of the director but never interrupting the narrative for the audience. If the audience is distracted because the box is in the, the box of the pantyhose is wrong and it's something you could buy at Rite Aid right now, they've stopped thinking about the story. So you want to never interrupt the audience or distract them, particularly so important with military because inevitably you'll have someone whose father was in the military and they'll say, well, my dad didn't wear those oak leaves because he was X. So you have these things of insignia and details are highly influential for the audience and the actor who becomes the character. When you can tell the actor, this is the actual insignia for this rank and this uh, category of military service, it becomes much more real to them and it helps them with an authenticity for character. Okay, so back to Colby's question though, in 1929, everything dropped down again so that by the time we have 1934, we're at 10 inches off the floor. In the twenties, you know, we, they had bound breasts, they were short, the skirts came up to the, just below the knee. And then now we're gonna cover up because we're gonna recover, we're in, this period of depression. That goes on until we get influencing from World War II because we have rationing and we have not enough materials. All of the silk went to make silk parachutes. So we started getting the first synthetics to create stockings, to create imitation silk, uh, rayon and acetate for dresses because silk was no longer available and everyone wanted to support the war effort all over the world because it was a world war. So then things got shorter and we had the military influence like the first picture that I showed you, this one. You can see how this could be, you know, a military jacket, right? Yes. And women would never have worn trousers at this time period, except for casual wear. And so when you're putting somebody in trousers, you're putting them in a very big statement piece. The audience may not know that, but the actor will know that. And then what happened after the war, this is what I'm, this is Colby, what I'm saying about arbitrary design for fashion. Mm -hmm. In 1947, when Christian Dior dropped the skirt, added yards to it, and then went from this knee length to a very full, and I think you have the voluptuous picture here. And if you go to fit them downtown, you can actually see the garment because they have it in their gallery. Nope, I don't think it's here. I'll try and find it for you and I can show you. But just so that you know, the that is the first time when it really became um, 
apparent that it was just a fashion arbitrary statement. Mm -hmm. And then from then on, money dictated um, fashion. So, oh, we need to have a, here we go, this is a good one. I'll show you this so that you can see this. So we go from that one jacket that I showed you to this super full skirt, multiple of pleats, and look, it's practically as long as it was in the 30s, a very shaped jacket, very full hip, a beautiful sleeve, excellent uh, kid gloves, and here's the front view of it, right? Luxurious fabrics, and this was the new look. Now suddenly, well, we couldn't wear those skirts that are straight and short, and you're wearing those and you're out of fashion. And you can see how beautifully the collar is. This is called pad stitching right here. So again, this is from the Museum of Metropolitan Art. You can look things up. I just, and you can find things that way. But after that, I mean, you know, this period of where we are right now, where the natural waistline is now creeping back up, but the low waist that happened in the 1970s, bell bottoms happened in the 70s. Then we went back to straight legs. Then we went back to tight legs. Then we went to the natural waist, then we got the waist down so that if you want to appear fashionable, then you need to follow these trends. And then, then what happened is we manufacturing got very cheap instead of things being hand done, everything was machine done starting in the late 19th century. And then after about the seventies and when things started going offshore, they st shut down a lot of the textile mills in the US. There's actually very few left. It used to be a big, manufacturing part of the United States. And you know, now we, when we talk about child labor, are you buying clothes that are built on child labor? And you can look that up. So when you're buying the t-shirt that is $10, you're buying something that's cheaper than it was in the 60s. Because you're buying something that has been manufactured basically on the backs of others because all of the manufacturing has gone offshore. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, if they decide and, you know, who's our fashion trenders? I mean, why the heck are the Kardashians the fashion trenders? I have no idea. Well, that's kind of what I was getting to. Like there was Princess Diana and every they had every girl wanted that haircut type of thing. They wanted to look like her. And, and before that, it was Farrah Fawcett. Yeah. And after that, it was Jennifer Aniston. I mean, you know. Yeah. Why? Instead of. Uh, why not look the best that you can possibly look? So that's kind of, I guess, like a harder question to answer. Like, I was just getting, like, was there always this, there seems to be some sort of, like, always a pushback or something. Like, people have, the, like, people have an opinion about the Kardashians, even though they're influential with their fashion decisions. Like, there's, I, you know, exactly. So it's like, how can we deny their influence and all, like, I don't know, still hold fashion as an important part of our culture. Like, can it be recognized all these people are influential in this way? And it's just, they're not really harming anyone, but they're just rich people that buy things and wear them out. Well, uh, or not, wear them one yeah. time, throw them away. Yeah, I got, yeah, that type of thing. You know, wear them one time, you know, I've been on, you know, I'm a great, I love hand-me-downs. Yeah. And I have a friend who's very rich and hands me down to me and I get things with price tags on them. Yeah. You know, uh, I, uh, I, I guess it depends on <clears throat> point of view. Okay. You know, well, I, I don't think the Kardashians are influencing fashion. I think the Kardashians are influencing mass consumerism. Because I don't know that the designers are necessarily looking to the Kardashians to design clothes and set out the next season based on what the Kardashians would wear. I think there's two different levels. And I think people, people confuse the two because of celebrities and popularity and all of those trends that the Kardashians have influenced are crap. I mean, and if you look at makeup wise, right? Oh. I mean, a lot of their makeup stuff came actually from drag queens from the seventies. Like it's nothing new, but yet they've made it 
so that young girls and boys need to feel the need that they have to bake their face and put that much makeup on in their 20s, which is the time you shouldn't wear all that makeup because you have really good skin. Right. Chances are, you yeah. know, so I think it's a, I don't think they're influencing anything in the longevity or in real life, if that makes sense. That's just my opinion. They're they in- do have clothing lines though. They they, do. I know Kendall and Kylie have clothing lines. So there are clothing lines that, you know, well, even Sears had the Kardashian clothing line 10 years ago, you know, not, or in 2013, you could go into Sears and here's the Kardashian clothing line. Um, and that's always very suspect because of course they're working with a designer. They're not actually designing. They're just saying, right. oh yeah, I like this, or, you know, this goes over my big butt or whatever, you know, great right. stretch, stretch clothes are perfect. Um, it goes along with plastic surgery. You know, everybody needs to have, it does everybody need to look you know, like this. Um, And also there's another thing to think about in terms of fashion is, Cara goes along with what you're saying is, you know, that idea of ripped jeans came from the movie Flashdance. That was the first time it happened. So a costume designer did it. A lot of trends happen when a movie becomes super popular and then the fashion designer takes that idea and, and then monopolizes it or monetizes it. So it happened with Annie Hall. It happened with Bonnie and Clyde in the 60s. So movies can be a big fashion trendsetter as well. It just depends on if a designer is gonna take hold of it. When Westerns started coming back, Ralph Lauren did a lot of Westerns and came in and did a, a whole Western line, but never giving credit to the origin or the resource that they used for the, for the design. But somebody was going to say something. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Sam. Well, you can also look at the popularization of like diamonds being used as jewelry, like high end expensive jewelry, because before yeah. like the 1900s, they weren't popular in any way. And they weren't valuable. You know, the value is in what the market will pay. And I've always, so, you know, Colby, it goes along with what, how do you want to present yourself? So I'm, I'm sort of totally anti-logo. I'm anti, you can see I never wear a logo, never. Yeah, you're right. You know, I don't wear, I never buy anything that has something written on it unless I buy something like, you know, Alaska, because I was there. Mm-hmm. And then it's curious. Like Calvin Klein kind of put his name first yep. on the stuff and then ever since then been the thing to do. I don't know. I guess it meant you had enough money you could afford to buy Calvin Klein. Yeah. And then it became, a, and fashion becomes a status thing. You know, my daughter was, she was like thrilled when she said, wow, ripped jeans. I said, yeah, you know what? Go to Goodwill, spend $7, buy a pair that fits in here. I'll show you how to do that. Because that again is nothing new. When, when in the sixties, you could make a racing stripe grow up your pant because you would just pull the threads out to create You know, woven, remember I told you it's like this. So if you pull all these threads out, you're going to only have the white threads left. Mm -hmm. And you could make a stripe, go up your pants by just taking the certain threads out. So it depends on, it depends on how interested you are and how much you want to do that. And if you, if you give weight to that, there's nothing wrong with giving weight to fashion. If that's what you want to do. I just never wanted to spend my money there. I didn't have a lot of money. I worked hard for every dime I got and I wasn't going to put my money there. I just felt like, you know, my daughter loved Britney Spears. I said, okay. So when she started doing crazy things, you know, shaving her head and all that, I said, so every dime that you spend to buy something, you're supporting her, that you're supporting that bad um, behavior. Is that what you want to do? It's like, you need to buy. I personally feel that you need to buy with a conscience. That's why you can buy free trade goods and goods that are not uh, based on, um, you know, people working at poverty level or not a fair wage. So you have to think about that. Are you going to buy with conscience? But it's important, you know, different things are important to different people. So, and it's all, it's all makes up the world. But well, let's take our break, you guys. We can totally talk about this forever. I know. Thank you. That was very, that was a very thorough answer. I'm glad everybody got to jump in a little bit. 
Yeah. So if anybody has anything else, you can just bring that up, but we'll pause and we'll come back at 1130. We'll take a seven minute break. What we're going to do now is work on your presentation sketches. So I will, uh, I have a breakout room open and I will have you in there. We'll talk about your rough sketches and I should spend a couple minutes with each person. And meanwhile, you can work on your presentation by getting your your paper out, creating the sketch, decide. At, by the end of today, you should be able to show me how you want your page laid out, how you want your title to be, how you want your character to be, how are you gonna use, are you gonna use a font or a type? What are you gonna do for your um, labeling of your sketch, okay? So I'm just gonna pause because otherwise when we go in a breakout room, it records us there. <laughs> 